Good afternoon again. Uh, my task is to introduce uh, Professor Reinhard Genzel. He was awarded in 2020 by Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of a supermassive compact object in the center of the Milky Way. Uh, he shared the Nobel Prize with Andrea Goetz and Roger Penrose. Uh, I think that uh, Reinhard Genzel uh, uses uh, uh, infrared at some millimeter observation developing appropriate ground and uh, space-based instruments. Uh, this uh, new and cutting edge instruments followed the S stars orbiting around the Sagittarius A star, showing that there resides a supermassive black hole. The shape and orbital evolution of the S stars confirmed the prediction of general theory of relativity, providing another test of it. Please, the stage is yours. I think uh, that the title is a 40 years journey, which we would like to know how it was, this 40 years journey. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Grubhover and Professor Palush and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here to tell you about a subject which you know about, I'm sure. We know about it too from the physics side since more than 100 years uh, from the point of view of general relativity. And now, as I will show you, it's become a matter of true hard experimental physics in many ways, black holes. As I will tell you, the issue of black holes emerges from Einstein's theory 170 years ago when he presented his theory in Berlin uh, to the Prussian <coughs> Academy and was a basic result, a basic consequences of the fact that in his new theory and in contrast to Newton's theory, photons, which have no mass, despite that, experience gravity. So that, we know about gravity, of course, as human beings, if we jump up, we come down pretty quickly and cannot leave Earth. We can leave Earth now with rockets, but light, we would have thought, has no problem escaping masses. And that is not true if you have a massive enough object and a compact enough object, as I will tell you. Anyhow, this is the story of black holes in the sense of actually showing that these objects are not only popular in science fiction, uh, but also in the hard sciences. Now, it's a subject which is hard because gravity is actually a weak force. And to see these subtle effects of, of general relativity is really a, a difficult thing. You can do it in the limit of the laboratory physics or the solar system since about 50 years, but only lately. Uh, uh, in astronomical objects. It's interesting that of your four uh, prize winners, three have to do with black holes. And Kip Thorne will show up pretty soon. Uh, Martin Rees is one of the foremost thinkers about the theory of how black holes form. So somehow you must be uh, in favor of black holes. In my case, of course, because we are doing experiments, it's something which I don't do by myself. In fact, it's not something I do only on Saturdays. Uh, it's something which took me 40 years and more, and you will see uh, why that is. Because to get where we wanted to get, to try to actually uh, deliver a thing you could call a proof, is a very difficult thing experimentally, and many young people over the years have helped. And the European co cooperation in the the Southern Observatory, who you see there, which you see there in the background, the ESO uh, telescopes in Paranal in Chile, have played a major role in this. The Czech Republic is part of ESO, so you are part of the family uh, doing this kind of top stuff, and uh, I'm very proud for Europe, because 100 years ago, uh, astronomy was dominated by the Americans, before that by the British. Now it's Europe, fantastic thing. Let's hail to Europe. Okay, so let me take you to a trip uh, uh, from the Milky Way out. 
Now this is going to be a pretty fast trip because we are moving at 10 to 12 speed of light, uh, but in the computer you can do that. We are traveling here through our Milky Way from the outer parts where we, where we live, uh, 27,000 light years away from the center. And here you see the plane of the Milky Way. The Milky Way has uh, a thousand, hundred or a thousand billion stars and has several uh, tens of uh, thousands of uh, light years across. And as we travel further, we see other such objects, which we call galaxies. Galaxies consist of stars, which uh, form, of course, from interstellar material, um, then uh, generate energy through the fusion of hydrogen to helium, and then die, and then the next generation of stars also forms. And galaxies are sort of the islands where what we call baryonic material, normal matter, is, is confined in. And these objects also come in small to big varieties. Our Milky Way is sort of an average of the mil, mil so-called disk galaxy, and uh, about 10 to the, uh, almost 10 to the 11 solar masses of material in, in, the, in the Milky Way. So this is sort of what we can see. That's what we can see. We can see the stars, we can see the gas, uh, and we suspect there is also another another bit in there, which is called dark matter, in the outer parts of galaxies, which actually dominates the mass budgets of the galaxies. We don't quite know yet what dark matter is, actually. We suspect it's a particle uh, of some mass, uh, but, but, but not interacting, interacting uh, with anything uh, but through gravity. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> So let's, let's talk about black holes, which is another uh, player in this game. So I did mention already the, uh, uh, the theory of Albert Einstein. And one year later, uh, Carl Schwarzschild, whom you see there on the upper right, uh, actually was able to solve these field equations of Einstein's for one particular, one would say, easy case of spherical symmetry. And there, for the first time, you could see that a new phenomenon other than gravity was at play, and that is uh, a so-called event horizon. The fact that there is a characteristic size in an object with mass, if the mass is compressed to less than this uh, size, then light cannot escape anymore. I'll, I'll say more about this uh, later. General relativity was tested, so to speak, in the office of mathematicians for the next 50 years. Uh, one wasn't clearly uh, sure how to interpret many of the things uh, Einstein's theory uh, uh, proposed or predicted. For instance, the emission of so-called gravitational waves. When two objects interact with each other, say orbit around each other, not only uh, force is exchanged, but also the force is transported in the uh, space-time uh, metric through a, a prediction called gravitational waves. Then Roy Kerr uh, presented in the 1960s another solution of the field equations where, in addition to mass, uh, uh, his black hole also had a rotation, a spin. And then finally, there is a third property black holes can have, and that's an electric charge. Remarkably, general relativity predicts that you do not need any other quantity. Black holes are very simple objects. We say they don't have hair. They don't have hills. They don't have valleys. Uh, they are just to be described by three properties, or rather two for the astrophysical object, and that's spin and mass. Hawking went beyond this by saying, well, okay, this is the macroscopic classical description of general relativity, but there must be a part of general relativity 
which connects this to the quantum world. Because there's one prediction in the general relativity case is that the energy and mass of the black hole is all concentrated in a point, a zero diameter point in the center, so that the density of energy there is infinity. That's, that doesn't sound right. Physicists have a lot of experience with these infinitely small objects. The Greeks thought that atoms were not dividable. And then in the 19th century and early 20th century, we, we learned that atoms consist of a nucleus, the protons and the neutrons, and then surrounding it, a cloud of electrons. And then when one looked at the neutrons and the protons and the electrons with higher energy, they also don't, didn't turn out to be points. They turned out to be finite size objects if you just had enough resolution. In that same spirit, most physicists nowadays say, Something is wrong with general relativity. Again, another singularity. So if we had a quantum theory, which we don't, then maybe we could understand that and, and find that it's not so. So many say that black holes not only are of interest to just show that they are there, which is the subject of my talk, but also they are an extremely fascinating subject for modern physics. They are, so to speak, the atoms of the 21st century. That's what some people are saying. Okay, so let's, let's go back to the, 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 to the concept. There's the sun. And, and let's, in our mind, put a rocket on the surface of the sun and then let it leave the sun. Then we can, with Newton's theory, calculate how fast the rocket has to be in order to escape the surface of the sun and get to infinity. That's a simple physics uh, question you physics 101 so to speak you do in in school or in university and the answer is 600 kilometers per second for the earth the number is 11 kilometers per second all right so that's a finite speed in order to get, get something to infinity but now let's in our mind keep the mass of the sun but make the sun more compact then its gravity is stronger that we know from Newton so let's make it not the size it is, but three kilometers in size. Let's calculate with Newton, with Newton, the velocity of the, of the rocket, and we end up with a number which is 300,000 kilometers per second. So what? Well, that's the speed of light. And we know through famous experiments in the end of the 19th century, the Michelson-Morley experiments, that there is a speed limit in our universe, and that speed limit is light. Nothing can go faster than light. And so, if I make that sun here another millimeter smaller, then the escape speed is greater than the speed of light. That's not possible. So that means, conceptually, I've generated for you now an object which has a characteristic size called the event horizon within which no photons can escape, no particles, by the way. But if we can't see it, how can we know it's there? And the answer is through gravity. You know our solar system. We have the sun in the center and the planets orbiting around. And Kepler's laws, Kepler of Prague, uh, Kepler's laws teach us that the planets move on orbital speeds which uh, decrease as you go from the inside out with one over the square root of the distance from the center. And that is true whether or not the sun shines. So our conceptual black hole sun there also would do the same thing. If you would, all, if you would measure the, the planets in Tycho Brahe of Prague, would measure the, the orbits of those planets, they would pretty much have the same uh, orbital speeds. So that's how we can see black holes, through their action in space-time on uh, other bodies, other masses. And that, as I explained to you, not only holds for masses, but also for photons. So here we have two tools already, how we can look at black holes even if we can't see them. All right. Next step is, do they exist? So I told you about the work in the 60s, and Roger Penrose was sort of the one who culminated uh, this entire uh, mathematical underpinning of the, uh, of the theory, um, showing, in fact, that, that these black holes, which the theory predicts, 
likely would occur in extreme situations where collapse occurs and are not just an imagination of sort of special solutions of the theory, uh, Schwegel symmetry, etc. And the first two cases where that then became of interest was the discovery of X-ray binary stars in the 1960s and this one here, the so-called quasars. The radio astronomers uh, were then uh, for the first time surveying the sky for radio waves and they were discovering all kinds of new objects which were not known before. So then they talked to their optical astronomy colleagues and said, please do look at coordinate X, Y, Z and see what's there. And one of these coordinates of this object discovered in Cambridge, 3C273, uh, looked on the sky in the optical like a little faint star, a very faint star, but obviously a very compact object. That's why you see these diffraction spikes, very characteristic of something which is extremely compact. So extremely compact and uh, faint. But then when Martin Schmidt used the big Palomar telescope, five meter telescope, and looked optically at the so-called spectrum in the optical, uh, there were very characteristic emission lines in the spectrum of these quasars. And the wavelengths of these, uh, the ratios of those, are very well known from the laboratory to be characteristic of hydrogen, helium, neon, and so forth. So that was, was all very normal, but, but all these lines were redshifted redshifted by 16%. At that time, that was a sensation because uh, it was known that the universe is expanding since the 1920s. But in the local universe, that shifts things by, you know, a percent maybe uh, to the red. But it's clear that in an expanding universe we are living, if you go to very large distances, the theory would predict that these redshifts become very large. So if you turn that around and calculate from that redshift the distance, you come up with a number which in the 60s was outrageous. 2.4 billion years. 2.4 billion years is the time light has traveled since it was produced in this object. And 2.4 billion years is not insignificant uh, travel time in our uh, age of the universe. Age of the universe is 13.76 billion years. So this is a significant fraction, very far away. But because it's far away, the faintness which we see here in our optical image is just an illusion and, and just the consequence of the fact that it's so far away and it's dim. That's the, you know, the one of our square dimming of light in a distant object. So if you convert then this distance and the magnitude of the star, which it appears to be, into what we call a luminosity, so the actual production of light, you end up with a thousand times the entire light of the Milky Way with its thousand billion stars. Now all of this light emission, a thousand times that of the Milky Way, however, occurs not in a hundred thousand light years across. It occurs in a very small region, which is less than a light year. That's astounding. That must mean that whatever produces the light in this object has a much greater efficiency of producing light than fusion in stars. That was clear to the theorists in the 1960s, and many of those then thought about the, the problem, and they came up with a very paradoxical explanation, black holes. Now wait a second, you say, black holes, you just told us that light cannot escape from a black hole, and now you tell us it's a, the lightest, the, the brightest uh, object in the universe. How can, how can that fit together? Well, the fact that in a black hole there is a characteristic radius, the event horizon, within which light cannot escape does not mean that light cannot escape from further out, where gravity is weaker. So if you turn this around and think, well, if material is falling into a black hole, say as a gas disk, which you see here, then uh, this, this gas, which is falling in, so to speak, in a spiraling uh, form ever further in, and the friction in this disk then uh, acts on redistributing what we call angular momentum, so that the angular momentum is trying to transport outward and the material transport inward, then energy due to gravity, potential energy as we say, can be converted into radiation. And if you calculate the amount of energy you can convert into radiation very close to the event horizon, you come up with an astounding number. It can be as much as 40% 
between 10% and 40% of the MC squared, the famous MC squared of Albert Einstein. Fusion is about 0.01 MC squared. Okay, so that's you know, a gigantic difference. So the gravitational self-energy of a particle falling into a black, black hole before it enters the event horizon far outshines, far out, is far larger than what, what is produced in fusion. So that was the proposal. And there are many very famous people here who worked on this, Martin Rees included, Rashid Sunyaev, Roger Blanford, and Donald Lindenbell. But the question is, do you believe it? Well, as a scientist, you don't have to believe anything. People tell you, you just, uh, you have to show it. And how can you show this? Well, the answer I've given you already, you would have to go into this quasar there and measure the motions of the gas which is uh, orbiting there. And then you have to show that as you go inward, the mass speed of that gas disk is increasing with one over square root over the distance. And the amplitude then should tell you that the mass is the mass of this object in the center. That's what you should measure. Well, that was not possible in the 1970s because the quasars are far too far away. It is actually possible now, just barely, but Lyndon Mellon Reeves wrote a very famous paper in 71 where they said, well, quasars are obviously very rare objects. That's probably because to make them that bright, you need a lot of material falling in, and that's rare. Well, but if it's just rare, maybe the reason that the quasars are rare is that actually black holes at the centers of quasars are common, but the accretion is rare. So maybe other galaxies, uh, both then and, and now, also have black holes. Maybe all galaxies. And indeed, of our trip we took just before, all our neighboring galaxies we now know have black holes, massive black holes. Some of them much more massive than our own, actually. So indeed, in retrospect, uh, Lyndon Bell and Reese were right. And then they said, well, if that is the case, then you don't have to look in quasars. You can go nearby. You can go to neighboring galaxies, and there maybe you have the resolution to see the central mass effect. Well, try it in our own galaxy, because our own galaxy, by far the closest galaxy, uh, our own Milky Way Center is 27,000 light years away. For astronomy, that's around the corner. Uh, and certainly uh, about 20,000 light years, 20,000 times less far away than the nearest uh, active object like a quasar. So, so that was the idea, and indeed that is what triggered then the first attempts uh, to look in the galactic center. So the galactic center and, 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 and spending energy and time on showing that there's a black hole is not for, in a way, not for the black, not for the galactic center per se. It's for the concept of black holes. Okay, so in, uh, in reality, that is what you see when you come in from the outside of the uh, galaxy where we live and, and fly into the center and you see, you don't see much other than the stars in the outskirts. You see that black stuff. That's in fact stuff, dust between the stars, interstellar dust. And that's dimming uh, the optical light by large factors. So that is uh, why we cannot actually see the galactic center in the optical or with our eyes. We have to go to a longer wavelength. In fact, what we've done here, we're already changing our glasses into infrared eyes. Uh, in the infrared, longer wavelengths, we can look into the galactic center, and there we can uh, look at the central region of our galaxy. And when people did that in the 1970s with the new techniques of infrared astronomy, radio astronomy, and also X-ray astronomy, what they saw was very interesting things. First of all, the blue stuff here are indeed a very dense uh, collection of stars, about a million times more, a million times denser than the stars around our sun. Very dense star cluster. Then in addition, the radio astronomers saw wisps of ionized gas, both ionized in, in, in pink color here and then neutral in green color on a scale of a few light years. And in the center of all of this uh, is a compact, very compact radio source we call Sagittarius A star. That was discovered in, in the mid-70s. 
So here we are set to do our Kepler experiment, which I described in a minute. Here is our X marks the spot, so to speak. That's likely where something would be if, if it's there. And, and, and you could indeed use these gas clouds, say, for measuring the motions because we can see the uh, emission lines from these gas clouds and then we can deduce from that the Doppler motion along the line of sight, the shifts in the motion which are very well known. And that indeed was, was, was done uh, in the next years. On the one hand, the radio astronomers uh, looked at the radio source, showed it was very compact, extremely compact, and the infrared astronomers, uh, led by Charles Towns, Nobel laureate for the invention of the maser and laser, uh, of all things, uh, in his later years started doing astronomy, and he knew how to build infrared spectrometers. And with that, he could look into the galactic center and measure these gas motions. And so on the bottom right here, um, what you see is the deduced uh, mass in logarithmic units as a function of distance from the center, from these motions. In the center, they use the gas, and then further out, they use the stars. And you see here the ma mass out here increases with distance. That means that the mass is distributed. It's the stars which make up the mass. But then within about three or four light years inside of that, the mass didn't seem to change anymore. It was always a few million solar masses. So Towns and his group, and I was then in Berkeley, a postdoctoral and in a young faculty in the physics department, we jubilated. We said, ah, that's a black hole. But nobody believed us. Nobody believed us. That's science. Why did they not believe us? Well, because, number one, uh, these gas clouds, yeah, you can measure, so to speak, a Doppler motions, but is that really gravity? And uh, gas can be, you know, pushed around by, by stellar winds, it can be pushed around by other gas, can be pushed around by magnetic fields, etc. So it's not a good way of, of really measuring gravity with, with, with certainty. More importantly, however, if you take this mass of a few million solar masses as the potential mass of a black hole, well then, this distance we, we got to here over a light year or so is a million times that of the event horizon. One million times. And most of our colleagues say, well, it yeah, could be all kinds of other stuff which is hidden in there. As long as it's faint, you know, you may not see it. Maybe be you know, faint stars, in particular at the time, pulsars just had been discovered, pulsars and black, stellar black holes also were in everyone's uh, thinking, so stellar black holes might be there. How, why do you know that this is, must be a, a real massive black hole? So we didn't. Back to the drawing board. How could we do better? What do we have to do? Well, first of all, the first obvious thing is I replace the, the tracer gas by the much better trace of stars. Second, measure more closely to the black hole, if you can. And that requires uh, new imaging techniques, high resolution imagery, new technology, big telescopes, etc. So this started in the uh, late 80s and the early 90s when I actually moved in as director to MPE, the sort of a whole phase of getting ready for the next phase.
Yeah, that's our superstar currently, the VLT, four eight meter telescopes in the best site in the world, Paranal in Chile. And that's where, when it got going in the late 90s, early 2000s, we then started building new equipment to uh, have higher resolution, to uh, remove the blur of the Earth's atmosphere's uh, uh, fluctuations through what we call adaptive optics and, and have uh, better sensitivity, better resolution, etc., etc. So that was our new tool. At the same time, our colleagues in the United States went also to 10 meter class telescopes, the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, and, and Andrea Guess at UCLA set up a similar program on the Keck, and that led to a, you know, a US, US a European a competition game, but one which actually was very nice in the sense that in a few years we got both, as you will see, results which are completely uh, com comparable and the same. And that, of course, is what makes the principle of the scientific principle. Yeah? I mean, you, you want to show that you have actual evidence and others can repeat it and get the same answer. That is the core of what makes science different from belief systems, okay? I didn't say religion. Uh, you have to be careful. <clears throat> Anyhow, so that's our machine. Does any one of you know why I played uh, the Bond uh, music? May, if you have ever seen the Quantum of Solace, then you, sh you should recall uh, it plays, last part of the movie, it plays when the Bolivian e evil guy uh, removed himself to this place, uh, which turned out to be this observatory, and then he was, you know, hiding himself away in the, what we call the residencia, that's where we sleep as, as astronomers, and then the Bond, uh, then Bond and the Bond girl fly in and, and rescue and so forth. That was the story. Now, it turned out that when uh, the movie was uh, made in, at that time, I was there and tried to sleep. And there, there is this one scene in the Bond movie when you know, they're rappelling down uh, from, the, from the roof of the building, the Bond girl, and then they uh, you know, rappel down, they go over there, and then they you know, get at the, the Bolivian evil guy. And they did this 10 times. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Yeah, science and movies. All right, so here are the two teams who then, you know, in the 90s, with this new technology, started measuring the motions of stars. And within a few years, we had success. What you see here are images of three consecutive years of the innermost region of the star field. So you see that cross, that's the radio source Sag A star in green, and you see a circle, that's one light month. So we are really already pretty damn close to the, to the central region. And you see in three different colors, red, green, and blue, the image of the field in three different years. Okay, and you immediately see there's a star very close to the cross, which obviously moves. And if you look up how much that is, it's 2,000 kilometers per second. That's 100 times the speed of the Earth around the sun. So now you can use Newton. You know the distance there, it's about, uh, uh, you know, about a light week or so, or a few light days. You cal calculate V squared R, distance, V squared is V velocity over the gravitation constant. It gives you a mass. And what comes out? A few million solar masses. The same few million solar masses we had seen 10 years earlier with the gas, but now in a reliable fashion. And both groups saw it. So now the astronomers said, hmm, maybe? The physicist, of course, was, ah, nah. This, 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 this. <laughs> But far, this is so far out still, it can be anything but a black hole. So how could we do still better? Well, this, this method here relies on a statistical comparison of the speed on the sky, uh, and that is a very uncertain method. So what you really would like to do is to measure with each star a mass. For that, you need more than just the velocity. You, meet, you need to have accelerations or even better, an orbit. So we, of course, uh, all have computers, so we can calculate uh, how long it will take to see an orbit. And it turns out a few hundred years. That's too long even for directors in the Max Planck Society, okay? <laughs> all right, so what do you need? You need luck. You need nature to help you, and nature really did help us. 
because nature gave us stars uh, which are on such uh, nearby orbits, highly elliptical orbits, that they bring the star at times to distances of the inner solar system. In this case, for this star, in 2002, the star moved to within three times the orbital radius of Neptune and moved there at a speed of about 3% uh, the speed of light. So then you go ahead, V squared R over G, you know the same uh, formula, and what do you get? A few million solar masses. But now, within uh, 15 light hours. Uh, that is a word. Uh, 15 light hours, there is, now you cannot speculate about a neutron star cluster anymore. That wouldn't fit in there. So by 2002, both groups had this evidence then. Uh, the physicists were saying, hmm. <laughs> But then others said, well, yeah, but you're relying on general relativity. Now, that is sort of a, a cheap one. I mean, you know, who doesn't, you know? Who doesn't? No, as a physicist, you have to say general relativity is tested in many regimes, but not in this one. Not at that mass, not at that uh, space-time curvature. So, honestly, you will have to... Uh, actually tested. How would you do that? Well, you will have to look for the deviations of the motions of the star when it's near uh, Perry, near the in innermost point uh, from Newton's orbit. And that is quite a call. Th these effects are very small, actually, at that distance. But you can calculate them, and we did. So in 2004, which is sort of a little halfway up there, we said, what, what do we do next? Well, we have to have a bigger telescope, obviously, to get higher resolution. Well, can't build, a, at that time at least, quickly a 20-meter telescope or something like this. But we have four. We have four 8-meter telescopes. And I'm a radio astronomer at birth. I know that you can get higher resolution by combining the light, interferometrically, as we say, between different telescopes and thereby generate a telescope which is much bigger than the diameter of the individual ones. That's called interferometry. Very well-known tool in radio astronomy, but uh, in, 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 uh, in optical astronomy, very difficult. In the meantime, let me say, uh, after the parry of S2 to now, both UCLA and we have seen the orbits of you know, about 50 such stars in the central region, thereby really measuring the mass and also the distance to the galactic center with absolutely incredible precision, 0.1% accuracy. So we know that a few million now to 4.304 yeah, million solar masses. And we know the distance to the, the galactic center to a, 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 you know, inc incredible accuracy because of the, you know, we are using the very well-known principles of Newtonian and, and, and general relativity. Motion. And the other thing we learn in this is that, in fact, the central mass, Sagittarius A star, does dominate, indeed, the mass. So there, is, there are other stars around it, and the stars we're seeing, but not much else. So that's, that's what we learned, and we were astonished to see how complex that structure is. Actually, I should say, please uh, consider this. In astronomy, we actually, up to that point, only knew one system where we can see actual motion, and that is the solar system, the planets around the sun, and you know, the work from Kepler and Tycho Brahe, etc. 
This is the sort of the second case where we can actually see online and can make a movie which is real, not just imagined. So that allows us to really measure the gravitational potential in the central so accurately with these stellar, uh, these stellar orbits. Now, I don't have the time to explain to you that there is another part of this research here, which is how did these stars get in there? Would you have expected them? Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not, and so the astrophysical side of this to astrophysicists is, is as interesting as the question of the black hole side. How did these stars make it so close to the black hole and survive? Okay, and why are, are they partly on these highly elliptical orbits? But I, I don't have time for this, but this is sort of a, a story uh, on its own. So here we are, 2003, as I said, designing the next stage which is to combine the light of all the four uh, eight meter class telescopes in 2016, just in time for the next parry of uh, S2, we were able to make the first measurement. And nowadays, this is from 21, uh, it's like, you know, if you look at this, we, we looked at this just a, a week ago, it's like in Times Square in New York City. I mean, you know, you go in there at any given time, you know, there are stars zooming through there at, you know, 3% the speed of light coming in there and, and, and moving. And every one of these stars gives us a very valuable information uh, on both the distribution of mass, as I said, as well as on uh, gravity theory. And let me, let me describe that to you. So we can see with these techniques now the motion of these stars, not anymore from, from year to year as we did back in the 90s, or month to month with adaptive optics on the 8-meter class telescope. Now we can do it from day to day. From day to day, with an accuracy which is equivalent to a few centimeters on the moon. Okay, so and some of us are saying, if, if, we, if there would be a football game on the moon, we could play, uh, you could be video assistant on, on the fouls being played by the players up there. <coughs> okay, so we can test general relativity. What do I mean by that? Well, general relativity predicts effects which you would not expect in Newton. The first one is that when you have a star or any other radiation source coming close to a black hole, then the clocks near the mass are going slower than the clocks at my position. Another way of saying this, if a star sends photons to me, they have to climb out of the potential uh, towards me, and that means they're getting redshifted. That we call the gravitational redshift, and that, in fact, is the largest effect. So what you see down here as a function of time is the change of the velocity of, of this star uh, relative to the Newtonian orbit. So in Newton, you would expect a straight line of data points. The general relativity predicts this red line. That's Perry. That's when the star was closest in May 18th of 2018. And you see the data beautifully delineate the, the red line. So we, with this, we can sort of quantitatively state that we see the predicted gravitational redshift from general relativity to very high accuracy. The next effect are precessions. So in the Newtonian theory, if you have a central mass, sun, and one planet orbiting said sun, then the planet will stay on an elliptical or circular orbit for all times. That won't change. Not so in general relativity. In general relativity, the orbit of this, of this orbiting star precesses in the plane of the orbital motion. That's called the Schwarzschild precession. In fact, Einstein uh, predicted that for the uh, planet Mercury, and it was then you know, shown to be correct. So this, this, this effect we can, we can see. And again, this is the way I can visualize it to you. Uh, as in the left diagram, I plot now on the right diagram, a so-called residual map. In this case, it's actually a map, um, uh, positions on the sky. But I've subtracted the Newtonian motion of the star. So in this way of, of thinking, just like here it was a line, here it's a point. So if, if Newton is right and GR is not applicable, the star should always be where the black line is. Whilst general relativity would predict this rather complicated little twirling of the residuals. And what we observe is this. Pretty, pretty damn close. 
pretty damn close. So that means we can actually say, A, of course, uh, Schwarzschild precession is seen at very high accuracy, but more, there are no deviations from it to the extent we can say that now, and that means in turn that there is no second mass. Because if there is a second perturbing mass, then you won't see these, uh, these wonderful little periods anymore. So from that we can make very detailed statements on how much other mass there is other than the big black hole. And that turns out to be uh, only about 6,000 solar masses in this general vicinity of the stellar orbit. That's nothing. Very unusual and not expected. But these stars are still about 1,000 times the Schwarzschild radius from the center. So when I say we, you know, we show that there's a central mass and general activity, it's all fine. But does it have to be a black hole? And for that, we would have to show, in the end, that the same mass which we're seeing in the orbits of the stars is also present within event horizon, or so shortly that, outside of that. How can we do that? Can we? Yes, we can, through two methods. One method is we see infrared emission from the radio source itself, once per day. It's variable. When we do that, we actually see things like this green curve there, or the green dots. We see that the centroid of the infrared emission actually wanders around on the sky in clockwise direction over about an hour, and then typically the, the emission disappears for another few hours, and then comes back another event a, a, a day later or so. And now we are on about five times the event horizon size. And the motion of this spots there is the third of the speed of light. So if you now go and make V squared R over G, what do you get? A few million solar masses. And that means that the same mass which we see in the stars with extreme precision also is in, uh, contained within a few times the event horizon size. There is nothing which fits in there. So that's one technique. The other technique is the same, but now with photons. And that you can imagine as follows. Suppose there is a, a central black hole, that is the, the blackish thing. We look at that from the left, and behind the black hole in blue is a light source. Then Euclidean uh, physics would teach, tell you, if the rays of light go out towards us, then those which fall onto the surface of the black hole or inside of the surface, of course, will be blocked. So there should be a central obscuration, a a black spot. But general relativity will tell you not only these rays, but also other rays which in principle uh, go out further. But they are being bent by gravity uh, towards our uh, direction. So there will be a bigger black region surrounded by a bright region. That's the prediction of general relativity. And we can calculate that from general relativity. If you know what the mass is in the distance, you can know that that, that angle. So if you do this with the mass which we know precisely from the stars and the distance which I've shown you, we know to a tenth of a percent, that ring of bright stuff on this side, this side, from there to there, should be 50 micro arc seconds. So about 10 centimeters on the moon. And what do the radio astronomers see? 51 micro arc seconds. So that's their uh, very nice result from uh, last year where they managed to get for the first time uh, a high resolution image with a, a technique which is very, very difficult with telescopes in the millimeter range spread over the entire globe of, of the Earth. Very difficult experiment and here you go. It, it does exactly what, what we thought it would. So with other words, let me reformulate this. This is the second element where we can see that the, you know, the prediction we have from the orbits of the stars in terms of the mass, et cetera, et cetera, can be shown to indicate that that mass must be within, in this case, about three times the event horizon size. Okay, 40 years. So it was, I must say, overall, a very exciting uh, trip in stages, so to speak. Uh, in 10 years stages in, in many ways. Initially, as you've seen, we were working out there showing that there is a transition from an extended mass into a mass which didn't change anymore. In order to make it better, we then moved for gas to stars 
and you know, went ever further in until we had the orbits of these innermost stars, which I showed you, and the peri of S2 and other stars in there, which definitely shows that, that the mass must be within uh, you know, about a, a thousand times Schwarzschild radius. And you see that the symbol denoting our measurements and that of UCLA are right on top of each other. So that, that, that is absolutely inconvertible evidence for that mass. But still, uh, as I told you, we don't know what's inside of it unless we can measure here, and we did. We have the Event Horizon Telescope measurement and we have these flares which tell us that the mass inside uh, of a few times the Event Horizon uh, radius uh, is, is, is the same as further out. So is it a black hole? Well, that depend, your answer will now depend a little bit on what your background is. If you're an astronomer, you say, hey. If you're a physicist, you say, mm. If you're a relativist, you say, no, I do. <laughs> so either the glass is half, half full or half empty. But we're not done yet. Let's be real, we're not done yet because there is the second property of the black hole which we have not measured yet, that is the spin. And then we need to measure the third thing, which is the sort of the, the king's prize, which is the no hair theory, to show that it's sufficient to have all other parameters of the black hole if you have the mass and the spin. So that's the work for the next 40 years. Probably not mine. But, one way of doing this is in fact now using gravitational waves, which I have not talked about much yet um, because they were not applicable to the galactic center problem, but in the future they may very well be, or at least to nearby galaxies, for a so-called extreme mass ratio in spiral. So if you have a big black hole and you have a stellar black hole, then that stellar black hole will orbit, but then when it's close enough, lose energy through gravitational wave emission. And that means it loses energy and starts to spiral inward until it merges with the big black hole into a, a black hole of mass, big black hole plus stellar black hole. So that is something one can calculate nowadays very accurately and one can measure this hopefully with a new machine uh, in space, a space interferometer called LISA, which ESA would like to uh, 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 develop and, and bring into space in, in about, well, 18 to 20 years from now, very difficult experiment, but if it does, if it works, then what you get to hear is something really astounding. So the physics was in the last millisecond If you get that right, then you can prove the no hair theorem. And everything else is, is sort of trivial before. That's just the gravitation wave emission, da 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 da. But the last, this last millisecond, and then the stop, the ring down, that is what the physics is. So we'll see whether, whether uh, Lisa will do it. Thank you very much.
you very much for this uh, beautiful sounding presentation. I think uh, it is clear that the uh, future is bright and uh, many things will come in the future. I think uh, there is now some time for questions, so please, uh, please, first question is in Greg. Mike, please take my What am I, my friends, you have used for this pro pro project? I mean, our, okay, our measurements, which I've showed to the stellar motions, uh, but also these flares, this is near infrared wavelength. So about four times the wavelength of optical light. Um, so there, in this band, the near infrared, you still, you know, you can see stars, uh, but you don't, you don't suffer so much absorption from the interstellar dust anymore. So you can look through the dust into the center. If you go to longer wavelengths, from the Earth, then it becomes much more difficult to measure because the thermal radiation from the Earth, from the telescope, because then you have to go into space. So if you want a big telescope, the near infrared is sort of a, an absolutely fantastic sort of region in between. Well, so please, other question? So there is a question, please. Uh, you see, you see well, I just wanted to comment that uh, you are a big propagandist for Europe, but play only American music. <laughs> no, no, wait a second. Did you not? Did you not hear Tchaikovsky? You also not Ukrainian. Ch Ch yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I played Tchaikovsky, <laughs> and uh, you allow me. <laughs> Russian music. Okay. okay. You have. Uh, well, I have some general question and then more specific. Uh, how? What was the impact of your covenant Nobel Prize winner Penrose on your attitude to these things? What was the effect of what? what COVID. Was the influence or impact. Of Roger Penrose on your uh, well you know, on your evolution. Well, I think uh, Roger was, I believe, quite pleased. Now he's old, okay? He's 93 years old. So I actually, I, I have not seen him in person uh, since. I've seen him at a, at a Zoom uh, meeting for his birthday, 90th yeah. birthday, but not since that time. But I, you know, on the other hand, as you know, if you know Roger, he's in spheres far above uh, uh, simple <laughs> experimentalists. Well, I think that he was extremely important, what you indicated, namely that there was this uniquinist theorem yeah. saying that there will be only Schwarzschild black hole and then people stopped to believe in black holes yes. because only Schwarzschild solution. It shows that it could be perturbation. So yeah, more general, yeah. What is, what is the limit of angular momentum in your case? Unfortunately, this black hole does not seem to... No, not yet. We okay. cannot, cannot quote anything. So I, in, in terms of the usual zero-one convention, I think a hundred or something like this. So it's, uh, not, it's not interesting. So no. you cannot measure any effects? There is no... no not yet. No, line, not yet. Like so what, 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 what we... The most likely... Uh, thing is nature has to come again to the rescue and give us a star uh, with a parry which is a factor of two or three in, inside. And then of course you gain a, quite a factor between the lens tearing and the Schwarzschild precession. I mean it's lens tearing even with you have a, a equals one spin, the lens tearing term would be about a yeah, about hundred times less than the Schwarzschild term. Now we see the Schwarzschild term currently with about 13 sigma, so yeah. there's no chance to see the lens steering term. Yeah. It's wonderful, in your case, you measured the greatest uh, periastron or so whatever, or peri <laughs> black hole precision uh, in, in whole, uh, among whole objects, even as compared with pulsars or compared, of course, with Mercury. Okay, well, let's hope that there will be more and more with uh, Einstein's, uh, well, with gravitational waves and, and with this uh, beautiful pictures which you have shown what do people do with a EHT telescopes. Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if uh, you think this is one of the longest uh, longest experiments because you said it was many different phases and overall it was like 40 years. So, so is that to your knowledge the longest experiment in physics or well, look, I mean, uh, we, we are not only doing uh, the galactic center in our research. In fact, the dominant part of my research group uh, deals with the early universe, and we are trying to understand how galaxies formed and how the relationship, I mean, uh, Jan mentioned this already, between black holes and galaxies evolved over cosmic uh, time. And so, in fact, we can use the same instruments 
for different uh, different questions. But I would say, you know, two, I, yeah, one really, one instrument stands above everything else, and that's the interferometer, because uh, the standard wisdom uh, of the optical uh, astronomy community since Michelson in 1920s is optical interferometry does not work. And because it's just too difficult. I mean, compared to the radio interferometry, it's a million times more difficult. And so uh, many people tried it. Uh, some people achieved it in the bright limits or with bright stars, but this faint stuff here uh, it seemed impossible. The fact that uh, my team, in, fa in fact, uh, Frank Eisenhower led it managed to do this in 10 years is just absolutely astounding, a major breakthrough in, in technology. Okay, so some more questions. <coughs> uh, maybe uh, just very quick, how has uh, receiving Nobel Prize impacted your life personally? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my my story, which I give, in fact, get, yesterday, yesterday on 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 Czech TV already was uh, referred to. Um, so I got a, an email about uh, maybe a week after the announcement from the chief of the ERC, uh, Bourgogne, and he said, Reinhard, you know, uh, you probably know this, but let me let me tell you, now the most difficult part of your life will start. And that refers basically to num number one, uh, really, to the fact you find yourself in the public and y people ask you all kinds of stuff. You're kind, you ask me kind things, but there are other people who don't ask you kind things. And if you don't learn how to not say what you think, uh, you're in deep shit. I mean, you're really in deep shit. And I, I was, within, within a week, I was in deep shit. I had a shit storm in the US because I made, you know, I. I love the United States. I live in the United States. I, I really don't like this guy, Trump. And so I said that. And so, you know, most of my friends in, in the US, of course, think the same way. But they didn't like that the German would t to talk about it. So, so that was hard, yeah, to not say things. And I still don't do that. And, you know, that's, that's difficult. Then the other part, of course, is traveling. I mean, usually you, from then on, you travel, but of course, then the pandemic hit, and so the first year was, was Zoom meetings. Now I'm traveling, here I am, uh, uh, but not so much, so that's, that's I would say, that's uh, still okay. Uh, then the next thing is you become, of course, um, you know, it's like in the medieval times when you become sort of the, the joker of the king. Yeah, I, I serve the Bavarian minister, President Söder. Uh, he owns me. <laughs> So he orders my presence and I have to show up, yeah? Uh, so these are the kind of things which, which happen, but it's okay. That's <laughs> okay, so Professor. Thank you so much. Professor Gensel, this morning you mentioned, you suggested uh, the risk as very important circumstance and one uh, really needs to know when take uh, take the risk and to go to such a risky situation, for such a risky situation. But uh, uh, I'm curious, uh, what's your experience with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with the luck, serendipity? How big role plays serendipity in astrophysics? Let's yeah, say. of course it does. So, I mean, can I put a number to this? I cannot really. But certainly, uh, I've, I've mentioned several times during the talk that nature has helped. Had nature not helped, I'm sorry, I wouldn't have given that talk. So it's very simple. In two ways, number one, that the stars are there, and, and then they, how extreme, so to speak, their behavior is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do this. There's a second part where I would say it's not just luck. I mean, you have to also, <clears throat> and that is something which I believe I do have a little bit of a, a, you know, a, a good sense for. You have to have a hunting instinct. And the third thing which I've learned from Charles Towns, one of the great men, I mean, I'm just a small Nobel laureate, he's a, he's a giant. He always would tell you, well, you know, Reinhardt, you know, you have to understand, you do things well and you enter a field and you do, do things like I did the maser and the laser, but then after a while, you know, you, you're in your forest which you've explored and then you meet other people and you ask them, well, why are they here? Well, because you've heard of your work, that's when you have to leave the forest. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in your talk, 
you nicely showed how it's important to combine different wavelengths actually. So your uh, infrared measurements, but also uh, radio or millimeter measurements for the event horizon telescope and X-ray measurements for uh, the flares. So my question would be about the, uh, another arena which you have not mentioned that is uh, very high energy cosmic rays because you know there are these particles coming to the Earth and we don't know where they are coming from but uh, galactic center is one of possible sources. Do you expect that we will actually learn uh, more about... Oh yeah, well, mm -hmm. well I mean of course uh, the high energy uh, cosmic ray community is ex trying to do exactly that and making correlation analysis between AGNs and and, and uh, cosmic ray emission and think they have a signal. Uh, I would say the problem there, obviously, and you know that, is just the, the number of events you have, so that you are ending up in this sort of uh, statistical regime where you can't be really very sure. And, and, and that, if you, get, if you get stuck too long in that, that uh, framework, that's not so good. The other thing, of course, is you cannot do imaging in the, in, in the, in the uh, gamma rays very well. Okay. At a, at a terra uh, electron volt you can, but, but in the sort of one to a few MeV range you don't have resolution. And so that's, 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 I mean, this is actually true for the gravitational waves as well, right? I mean, even LISA will have only a way to pinpoint very roughly where the source is. So unless you know where it is, uh, you know, you can't really measure it. So I would say uh, as spectacular as these phenomena are and, and potentially really telling is, uh, for my taste at least, I like to make the measurement more obvious uh, than, than they can. I'm sorry, I have just a technical note. Uh, because this is scientific event and we should be true and, and precise as much as possible. Just the final piece of music you commented on uh, is not European music for sure, but this is also not American music. This is the iconic song Highway to Hell by ACDC, which is famous Australian rock. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's decide that then by fist fighting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, look, I, you know, your, your, your first point about the European music, uh, many of my other uh, musical pieces you have not heard today uh, are from Johann Sebastian Bach. So, Bach, yeah. So I play a lot of Adra Schiff, uh, whom I personally know and, and, and so forth. Just in this particular series, you got to hear uh, others. Okay. But Bruce Pedro says that if he would like to take something, on island, some type of music, he would take only uh, what I say is uh, not motetta by Bach, but you know, actually religious music, despite the fact that, uh, which are on various occasions, uh, these are not motetta, but they are called, uh, well, it doesn't matter now. I mean, there is one which is with Weihnachten and another with Ostensein, etc. And so then he would take these. But because his wife would protest, so that he will also select some Vivaldi and other music. Okay. <laughs> but by the way, if I may add one remark concerning Bolzano for young people and concerning COVID time. Bolzano was really a big, big uh, human being and he was a and a mathematician, etc. But I like to say to students how they should behave when they are sick. Bolzano wrote an autobiography and he said whenever, and he had big problems with blood, uh, Etc. and this is uh, uh, well, uh, big health problems. And he said that he would always take Euclid's basics of uh, geometry, and that would always help him. Very <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice advice. So we, should not, we should consider this uh, Euclid's. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, uh, you, as I say, I, some of you have heard me say this that in audiences, I, I. Uh, often hear the question, now what about wormholes? Um, have you tested whether what you see there is a wormhole? And, you know, I have two answers to this. One is, uh, I don't know, I'm an experimentalist, I don't understand that. Uh, that doesn't satisfy very many people. So I asked uh, Roger Penrose, Roger, you know, they asked me about wormholes. I don't understand wormholes. What should I say? Do you believe in wormholes? You know what he said? Oh, rubbish. 
But then, thinking about COVID, wasn't that a wormhole? <laughs> we did go through one, so to speak. I mean, time warp and everything included. <laughs> yeah, I have a question regarding the picture where the shadow of the black hole was depicted and the ranges on the size of the shadow was drawn. They were drawn quite generous. The ends were on the bright stuff. So is it the uh, author depiction of this with all its more <coughs> precision measurements related? And the second question, what was the object in respect to which the shadow of a black hole was uh, studied? The, the, what was the second question? What was the object in respect to which the shadow of a black hole was studied? That was Sarge A star, the, the central radio source. I, I don't know. So the first question is basically what the Event Horizon uh, team did to get their numbers. So I, the, the numbers I quoted was what you find in their paper. Okay, and so what they did was actually, uh, since the image analysis for this particular case is enormously tricky, I don't have time to get into this, uh, they used simulations. So in simulations where you then exactly know uh, where the photon orbit and these kind of things are in general relativity, and then comparing the beam smeared outcome into the image plane of the interferometer and then making a, a Bayesian analysis. So that's what they did with thousands of images, and that's where these numbers come from. Okay, so it's not, uh, they, they didn't go with a ruler and, and measure the... <laughs> Uh, I want to ask, does black hole have some impact on planet Earth? And if yes, shouldn't we be concerned? And okay. my second question is pretty stupid, that why black hole is black and why not some other color? Yeah, no, no, don't worry. Don't worry. And, you know, the story goes as follows. I mean, indeed, uh, the amount of energy generation in a quasar is so substantial, yeah? that in a quasar, if you were in a quasar, and certainly if you were in a planetary system in the nuclear region of a quasar, uh, you better leave, <laughs> if you can. So that's true, but that depends on the mass inflow into the black hole. And our black hole, the, compared to a quasar, the mass inflow rate is about you know, a fraction of 10 to minus eight that of a, of a quasar, so it's a small amount. The next part of explaining that is uh, there is a statistical uh, correlation between the mass of black holes, inferred black holes in galaxies, and the mass of the galaxy itself. And that is actually surprising because when you say the galaxy itself, you're referring to regions you know, 50,000 light years away from the galaxy. That's where most of the mass and therefore the light is coming from. So uh, the black hole in Andromeda knows it's in Andromeda, so to speak. So if, if, if accretion is in green in Andromeda and blue in, in another galaxy, uh, the Andromeda black hole says, I, I only see green stuff, so I'm in Andromeda. But the stars in Andromeda don't know that there's a black hole because gravity out there where the stars are which we see is not influenced by the black hole. So in other words, the black holes can be uh, destructive in, in on periods of extreme mass accretion, but in the normal states, they don't do much. Our Milky Way is an aging galaxy in a uh, geriatric universe. The geriatric universe is even expanding exp <laughs> you know, in an accelerated fashion such that the accretion, the mean accretion onto their black holes is going down and down and down. So what we see looking back in the first few giga years of the universe, which was many quasars, a lot of damage and all of this, is not going to happen, in, and it's certainly not in the Milky Way. I mean, now there is one but. Mm, from time to time, there are traffic accidents. And we will have one in four billion years. So if you're then still around, I would also suggest you leave. Then we are smashing together with Andromeda, and then, mm -hmm. So maybe it's similar to star formation, which also increases uh, with the aging of the Exactly. Yeah. So all the black holes uh, will, well, they 
trees or not draw with uh, so such Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's the point of it. Yeah. Okay, so other questions, please. So there is a question. There is another question. Um, I would like to ask you if, um, when you do such a discovery, uh, if you have some kind of like sister control group that um, that do the same research as you do. I mean, for example, in CERN, they don't uh, like publish a discovery unless a sister station, sister slash concurrent station, uh, makes the same discovery um, uh, independently on the. Uh, on the station that made the discovery? Yeah, so the answer is yes and no. Yes, uh, Andrea Guess got the Nobel Prize uh, as well as I. And uh, our teams have worked independently for the last 25 years. Yeah, so I mean the yes in an extreme fashion. Now, when you, when you talk about particle physics or, say, gravitational waves, uh, perhaps recall the first announcement of the uh, September uh, 16 event of LIGO. And everyone would tell you, okay, well, we, we've analyzed this uh, 15 times over or 100 times under and so forth, different teams and so forth. Is that believable? They were part of the same team. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a strictly speaking way, you want, if you want to uphold that, you cannot be in the same team. You would have to be competitors, and they were not. I mean, they were different teams. Don't, the event horizon people will tell you the same thing. Uh, they, they went to different rooms and analyzed all you know, their ways independently, yeah, maybe. Uh, so, but in our case, I think that the case is very clear. There were two independent teams competing harshly over 25 years, yeah. <laughs> but still, I think uh, when uh, you now have maybe gravity, which is uh, sort of uh, superficial of any other existing observing, observation method of the instrument, so it would be very difficult to uh, control or to check yeah. that you are... Yeah. That is in fact one of the, you wouldn't say criticisms, but uh, certainly caveats which Andrea would now give you if she were here. She would say, yeah, I mean the, the MPE group has now a machine which in principle is 20 times higher resolution than ours, but do they know, do they understand really truly their not statistical, but they are, you know, systematic error bars. So that's the same as what you're saying. Indeed. So the only fair answer to that would be every experiment on Earth which affects these very, very fundamental uh, questions have to be done twice. Ooh, at the level of CERN, how should well, we do you know, that? Even in CERN happens that sometimes they discover superluminous velocity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Eventually>. indeed. <laughs> That's <not> true. <laughs> Other questions, please? So there is Sonia. Sonia has a question. Uh, so if I remember correctly, I think you said that the black, holes, uh, black hole, the supermassive one, is in the center of uh, our galaxy. Uh, how do we define a center of a galaxy? Is it like the center of mass? Or? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And the answer is the same as in the solar system. So, what is the center of the solar system? Is it the sun? Strictly speaking, not, right? It's the mass centroid as defined by physics. So it's the combined center of mass in the classical physics sense. And the same is true for the galactic center. So uh, indeed, if I, if I measure the centroid of Sergei star, I cannot mathematically say that this is the center of the Milky Way. Indeed, you can compute that. What sloshing does a four million solar mass center, uh, central object have in the potential well it's in? The potential well is not very steep around it because the mass of the surrounding stars, etc., is relatively small, as I dis described. So the, the, so the Sag A star motion is substantial. You can calculate it. It's about 200 meters per second. And it will slosh, so to speak, in the, in the central region around there. Um, now, of course, if for practical purposes, that is the center. I mean, you know, uh, but mathematically speaking, you're absolutely right. We cannot, uh, but we would have to calculate the full uh, mass centroid of the system, and that's a little off, but 
for practical purposes not. Actually, just a little comment. I think that uh, in the paper by papers by Francois Comp and uh, Garcia Murillo, and all where they uh, observe this alma centers of uh, nearby nearby uh, active galactic uh, nuclei. So they say that the center of the galaxy of the disk-like motion is displaced, or let's say the supermassive black hole is displaced from the center. Yeah. So, so this is what they see. Yeah, and look, uh, the, the radio uh, VLBI community has been doing this uh, through an inertial reference frame of three background quasars. So they have actually triangulated where a Sag A star is relative to these background quasars. So that's a fair measurement. The reason I'm not mentioning it is the accuracy to which you can do this is, is not sufficient because you have to, first off, subtract a very large solar motion. But you're sitting yourself on a, on a, on a moving target, and that you have to subtract. And then you look at the error bars left over from that, then in fact that's about 20 times as large as that's 200 meters per second. So we currently cannot measure in an inertial reference frame well enough uh, to know where the center should be. We can calculate it, but we cannot measure it. Okay, I think Sonia has a question. You have talked about LISA and uh, how it will help us to understand or at least better describe black holes. Do you expect any important contribution from current or other planned uh, facilities like ELT or James Webb Space Telescope uh, concerning the study of black holes, especially secondary? Yeah, I think it's the early universe. It's, it's the fact that uh, James Webb now is pushing the, the redshift uh, horizon, if you like, uh, back in time to astoundingly small numbers after the Big Bang. Um, that still needs to be sorted out, as I mentioned this morning, in terms of what this actually means and how well they can do this. There's a lot of hype there, but it, definitely I expect them to do this. And then we go with the ELT, 40 meter ELT, and look at some of these targets, resolve them, and so then we will push the look back time to, I would say, probably to uh, 200 million years after the Big Bang, where it is now at a, at a giga year. So that's a factor of five. So that's pretty, pretty good. Um, what would we expect to see? I mean, it would it, we expect to say something about your favorite uh, question, who was the chicken and who was the egg? Who was first, yeah? And, and how did that initially evolve? Who grew fastest and all of this? So I would expect that, that you know, next 10, 15 years, we will learn a lot about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.